He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. Suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell, following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street. And then the angel suddenly left him. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent an angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said. And then he went to another place. At dawn, there was a great commotion among the soldiers about what had happened to Peter. Herod Agrippa ordered a, a thorough search for him. When he couldn't be found, Herod interrogated the guards and sentenced them to death. Afterward, Herod left Judea to stay in Caesarea for a while. So this morning we're con continuing our series on overcoming. And today we'll be discussing overcoming doubt. Now this topic is one that, if we're on honest, many of us here in the sanctuary have in the past or are currently struggling with. For some of you, something in your future that you're not even aware of yet will bring you to a moment of doubt. So the best thing that we can do is understand doubt for what it is and to, to develop a strategy, which we'll talk more about this morning, to overcome it when it arises. Now contrary to, to what you might think, the word doubt is actually not very prevalent in the Bible. It's only used 13 times in the NIV translation and 11 times in the NLT. In most of the verses, we are implored not to doubt. In, in fact, both Matthew and Mark tell us that if we don't doubt, we can tell a mountain to throw itself into the sea and it will happen. James tells us we should not doubt because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. But Jude recognizes a different reality in his letter. He says that we should be merciful to those who doubt, recognizing that our faith journey is one filled with peaks and valleys. So the, the band members of a uh, contemporary Christian group named Jars of Clay also recognize this reality, and this is their take on the subject. I would probably say at several 
couple different seasons in my life, you know, I can look at, I know that college was a real season of doubt for me, but I also know that there have been certain seasons since then, certain seasons in the, in the band that have, that have also been filled with the similar kind of, kind of questions. I think um, as we walked together and sort of tried to wrestle through what it looks like to, you know, be friends and believers together, we've come to really recognize that doubt is a very common key ingredient in that process for us. Um, I think that's why it comes out so much in our music, why we have so many songs that really provide sort of a, an arena to kind of ask those questions and to not necessarily rush to the trite answers because in the moment of doubt, you know, answers don't have the comfort that we often think that they should. often just takes the shape of, of trying to understand the character of God, the heart of God. And I think that that, that takes many shapes. It, it, will, it will be different questions for different circumstances, you know. When you lose a loved one, there's questions about, you know, where does this kind of pain fit into God's redemptive purpose? What is this struggle actually? What's the end result of this? That takes shape so much in a world where there's so much tension over, okay, we know that God is alive and well and is existing here on earth, but where is he? Where is he in these kinds of circumstances? Where is he in the crisis and tragedy? We've come to know that God is not afraid of those questions. He welcomes those, and doubt and all the questions that, that are born out of doubt are the major elements of, of a deepening faith. Uh, you have to you have to know the questions. You have to ask questions in order to have any semblance of an answer. Your love can make these things better.